So without any further ado um, for this talk, I, I actually debated what I should talk about. And um, I have this uh, kind of way of doing research where I kind of get bored after about a decade and then I want to move on to something else. So so currently I'm, I'm interested in questions about Banach spaces and um, analytic structures. So, um, so I thought I'd talk about this because it'll be fresh and hopefully you'll see some really interesting questions you might want to work on. Anyway, so this was uh, the usual thing, supported by the Barston Fund, and it's joint work, work with Noam Greenberg from VEW and Long Chan, who's uh, currently doing a PhD at Carnegie Mellon. He's a very smart master's student for this. So this is in memory of Barry Cooper. This is a, this is a classic old picture of some... So this is from 1989, 35 years ago. See if you can pick anybody there, can you? Well, well. so what have we got? It's got me, um, Kachera, Antonin Kachera, Gerald Sachs behind him, Giorgio Freddy, Barry Cooper right in the middle. He won the race, by the way. Um, Mike Stobb behind him, Ted Slayman, and you wouldn't. So this was, we did the, we used to do what something called the run for recursion theory. Now to be, I think it's the canter for computability theory or something, but anyway. So that's what we did back in the day. And uh, this was the actual conference pictures. I don't know why it's in black and white, but anyway, I got this from Mike Stobb. And it actually has the times of the runners up the top. So up, up, up here. Right, and that, uh, that's Martin Kuma. So it's a, it's an interesting old picture. You might want to have a close look at it. Right at the back there, you'll see Klaus and Bosch Bees. Uh, not too many ladies there, by the way, if you have a close look. Um, it was back in the day, a long time ago. Some people weren't born, right? 90, 1989 is a long time ago. I first met Barry in 1985 at Urbana. And um, yeah, how time flies. What a great influence he had on... The organization of logic in Europe. And it's a it's a fitting tribute that we're remembering him in this conference. So anyway, I'll I'll, I'll move on from talking about Barry. Um, so in this talk, so there's been increasing work in um I, I can't look back. There's increasing work in computable aspects of computable uncountable algebraic structures. Now that most of you or many of you will know that actually the very first paper in computability theory as we think of it, there's probably Turing's paper, and it was actually on the reals. It wasn't about um, finite strings, which is an interesting fact. And um, on the other hand, we kind of moved away from it. He, he did what was called Markov computability. Um, but I think it's fair to say computable analysis was developed as computable calculus for a long time. So you'd look at theorems from calculus or complex analysis or somewhere like that, and you'd do work there. Whereas I think there's been a lot of work recently on by the computable topology or computable analytic structures. And by this, I mean um, topological structures, metric spaces, totally disconnected, locally compact groups, things like that. There's a very nice a book <laughs> that you might want to buy soon um, to support me in my retirement and um, called Computable Structure Theory, a Unified Approach. And our thesis is that the countable and the uncountable can be combined. There's no reason to separate the two because basically when you study uh, uncountable structures, you're really coding these things with countable information. So anyway, in this talk, I'll talk about a number of open questions and recent results on computable Barnack spaces. They seem particularly challenging and particularly concentrating on a geometry. So for those of you that have forgotten or maybe never knew, um, you have a vector space with a norm and um, so, and you associate with that a distance function. And if that's a complete metric space, that means every Cauchy sequence converges, um, then it's called a Barnack space. Barnack spaces are fundamental mathematical objects or in uh, functional analysis of extensive applications throughout mathematics. So Barnack spaces are good things to study and they're not well understood. I mean, classically not well understood. Okay, so the modern history of these things began with uh, Pearl Richard's book, which is still remains an extremely good book on computable analysis. They were the first people to study Barnack spaces, our computable aspects. Um, Medikides, Narod, and Shaw, George Medikides, Anil Narod, and Richard Shaw, they studied computable aspects of the Hahn-Barnack theorem showing in the finite dimensional case it's effective, 
and showing that an infraventional case was not effective. Uh, there's a very long paper by Vasco Bratka called uh, Computability of Barnack's Space Principles that you can download for free from um, because it's just it, we never published it as a, anything but on the archive or Fern, Fern Universitat uh, repository. Um, many of these results I should I should mention many of these results we discovered. So when Milner Kov and I started looking at these things, we realized that a lot of the theorems that we proved were actually you'd see the same techniques of proof reoccurring again and again, and they're all basically consequences of. Um, computable compactus. So you could get rid of ad hoc techniques and replace them with the observation that these spaces are computably compact. By that, I mean that um, that for every, if you give me a K, I can give you a cover. I have an algorithm to give you a cover of, of size two to the minus K, of, for the cell size two to the minus K. There are lots of other definitions. There are about 20 equivalent definitions and it's been rediscovered many, many, many times. As the driving force. Okay, so what's our definition? I've said what I'm planning to study. Um, so a computable Barnack space, or at least a computable separable Barnack space. So what does separable mean? Has a computable dense, or has a dense sequence. So you have a like like the reals between zero and one. The rationals form a dense sequence. And so uh, a computable Barnack space is a computable vector space with a dense sequence. This allows you to name elements. So what does that mean? Well, it's just like when you first study calculus at school or analysis at school, an element is simply a Cauchy sequence. Well, if it's going to be a computable element, it better be a computable Cauchy sequence. Well, more than that, I better tell you how fast it's converging. Right. So you have a computable dense sequence making the operations of the norm uh, plus computable in the sense uh, as described for real functions. So that's not exactly what you would think at first, at first blush, because initially you might think, oh, well, that means that I'm only worrying about the computable elements. But no, I'm looking at here as an operator. So if I give you a, a fast name for uh, X and a fast name, um, If I give you a fast name for a real X and a fast name for a real Y, that means that I, at step N, I know X to within two to the minus N, and at step N, I know Y to within two to the minus N, then I can compute the, the distance between the two to within two to the minus, well, something. Um, let, let's say N just for simplicity, right? Uh, yes, that should be a computable function of N. So so even though, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of, you often hear, and, and let talks about computable analysis that you can't decide a quality on the reals. Well, of course not, of course they're infinite objects, but you can decide in a, in a reasonable sense. I mean, the sense that since they're, since they're infinite objects, if you give me an epsilon, I should be able to tell you, are they epsilon close, right? And so the quality is computable, but only if we interpret that definition correctly. So this is called the type two framework for reasons I don't really understand anyway. Um, so plus and times are computable functions in the same sense. And <laughs> part of the deal here is what the claim is that normal Barnack spaces, meaning ones that we would actually encounter if you were doing physics, for example, are computable, right? I mean, part of the leitmotif here of what we're doing is that we believe we're studying standard structures. We're not doing like exotic things. That's that's the belief. Um, now I'm, I'm going to address that in just a sec. So what are examples? Well, n-dimensional Euclidean space with the Euclidean norm, Hilbert spaces, the LP spaces, just in case you've forgotten, these are infinite sequences of reals where the norm of that sequence is decided that has, has that definition, which is the, the sum of the P powers when you take the P through. So for L2, it would be the 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 the, the square roots of the squares, the standard Euclidean distance, right? C0, which is the collection of infinite sequences of reals with the soup norm, but converging to zero. Uh, C the space of continuous functions with the soup norm. And what are the dense sets here? Because I have to tell you what the space is, and I have to tell you what the dense sets are. In each of the previous ones, the dense sets are more or less the rationals. 
This one, the dense sets of the rational polynomials, for example, I could easily choose some other kinds of dense sets, but that'll do. Um, and the, the other LP spaces. So these are standard spaces from analysis and they, they are um, examples of computable Banach spaces. Now, this is all fine if the space is separable, but there are lots of spaces which are, oh, well, I had a bad space there, but there are lots of spaces from classical mathematics which, which aren't separable. You know, I mean, it's a, just the fact. And L infinity, the collection of infinite sequences of reals with the soup norm, right? You can't compute the soup. I mean, how could you? Because you're going along and you think, oh, I think it's four. Oh, but then later on in the sequence, it gets bigger. And you go, oh, I think it's five. And it gets bigger. Oh, I think it's five and a quarter. And as so forth, right? So, that, and that's a very natural sequence. It's the dual space of L1. And all dual spaces have this property by and large. Most dual spaces have this property they don't don't have dense sequences. And these things, in the version of priority arguments, require attention. I and mean, to my knowledge, there's only one real study of this thing. Um, so, um, Vasco Bracker was the first person, really, to my knowledge, to address this. And he defined the notion of general computable norm space as one which is a represented space, which means there's some way of naming the elements, which I'm not going to get into. And um, he just says that convergence is okay, it's just you can't, you, don't, you can't have the norm. So you can't have both the vector addition and multiplication and the norm being computable. You, you get to choose. But if you stare at this for a little while, you realize they're always represented in this way and the norm is uh, left or right CE. That means you can approach it from below or approach it from above, always. So here's my first question. Say something about these spaces. Here's a two PhD projects, perhaps more. Just say anything about them because we know nothing about them. Just do something with them. And I think there are lots of nice questions you could study. I mean, you know, uh, under what circumstances is it true? If I give you a space, under what circumstances can I got my hands on the dual? When it when is it computable? And there are lots of theorems which are true in general for computable for, for Banach spaces, which do have computable analogs, but we don't know anything about them in the in the generalized sense. Um, well, classification. So, um, so let's let's go back now to the ones of which I was concerned. Uh, classification is given these objects, I want to try and classify them according to. Uh, isomorphism type. We've already heard um, Matthew Harrison Trainer talking about this in the context of uh, Burrell uh, cardinality theory. Um, classification's hard. And the reason is, um, crudely, we don't really have any good way of taking a graph and turning it into a Banach space. If you have a way, as we saw yesterday with Matthew's talk, if you have a way of taking a graph and turning it into an object, you go, aha. <laughs> these things are universal. Aha, I know how to deal with this because, well, I know how to deal with graphs. Graphs are very bad. Therefore, whatever I'm doing is very bad. And if the correspondence is, is quite, quite tight, I can deduce many things about the two. Um, first of all, the general classification problem is very hard. The isomorphism problem um, is sigma 1, 1 complete. Sigma 1, 1 complete, or something called analytic complete, means that um, at least from a computable point of view, it's as hard as any computable isomorphism classification problem. So given two trees, are they, are they isomorphic? Given to, given to any things, are they isomorphic? So it's as hard as classifying graphs, but you can't turn a graph into a Banach space. So we had to find some other way of doing the, the hardness result. Now, this was, had already been done earlier in a different context um, of Borel equivalence relations. It was shown uh, to be Borel complete as well. And that was using a completely different technique. That was using a technique called the Jones tree space, and where you take a, it gives a way of turning a tree into a Banach space. Okay, so Sasha Melnikov, my co-author um, back in Wellington, he's asked the following question, which I think could be accessible 
for each n, is there a delta zero n plus one categorical, but not delta zero n categorical Barnard space and the same for Polish groups. So um, categorical means that any two copies uh, are isomorphic at that level. So for example, dense linear orderings are computably categorical. So if I give you a linear ordering without endpoints, two, two copies of the rationals, if you like, as a linear ordering, then I can compute an isomorphism between the two. What do you do? Well, I say, take this point, send it to here. The next point comes on, haha, I'll send it back to here. And because they're dense, I can, I can, I can do that. So that says it's a computable way. There's only really one. So you've named the structure, there's just one. Okay, now there are other things like, say, omega as, as an ordering where they're not computably categorical, but they're dealt, they're, they're categorical relative to the halting problem, which is I'm delta two categorical. Give me any two computable copies, then the, the halting problem can produce an isomorphism. And um, so if you want to see a proof of this, the, uh, the, the result with Melnikov, you can look at this. There's a long paper called Computably, Com uh, um, Computably Compact Spaces, which we published in the Bulletin of Symbolic Logic, which discusses how this works. Um, anyway, there's a very nice theorem called Cadet, Cadet's Theorem. Um, the norm's the important thing, is the point of this. Excuse me. coffee. I should have cleaned it better. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I poured water into it, but I don't think I cleaned the coffee out. <laughs> anyway, so there's this theorem called Cadet's theorem. It's a classical theorem. And it says, if you forget about the norm and just view these as topological spaces, they're all, they're all R, R to the big N. They're all, in, in, you know, they're infinite dimensional. They're all the same. So my second question is, what's the effective uh, what's the effective content of the shop? Is it computably true? And I, I, I tried to do this, and it, it's not an easy thing. It's quite a difficult, um, it's a very difficult paper to, um, well, at least for me, to penetrate. I mean, I remember looking at it for about a month and having a lot of trouble with the analysis. These people are very clever, and they don't really write for fools. So, you know, you've got to, so they cut, I was cut out of the whole deal. Anyway, but that's a very nice theorem, and it's a very nice it's a very nice result, and it's something that could be possibly accessible. Um, so, what I want to concentrate on for the rest of the talk is the geometry of um, finite spaces. And um, so, the first thing you learn at school when you start doing vector space theory is how do you classify them? You will you use bases. You know, we punish first year students at university by linear combinations and independence and all that. So um, this is called a Hamel basis. So every element is a finite linear combination of elements of that vector space. Yeah, that's something we all know from school. Oh, well, first year university. Now for Banach spaces, this is bad. For infinite dimensional Banach spaces, every Hamel basis must be uncountable. By, by this is just a very easy category argument. Um, but if you stare at a space like LP, it's really coded by countable information. You stare at it and go, hmm, that doesn't look right to me. Why should it be the fact that I, if I have a, a, a basis for this, do I need? does it need to be uncountable? So in 1927, uh, so people had solved this question for some of these spaces earlier than this, but someone called Schauder in 1927 um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so he said, well, actually, you can you can classify them if you if you do it the right way by allowing infinite linear combinations. So, if X is a Banach space, the sequence is called a Schauder base, and I, spec I specify it's a sequence, not a not a it's not a set. If for every X and X, there's a unique sequence of coefficient, unique sequence of coefficients such that uh, sigma a i x i is x. So this is converging to x in the, in the norm, right? And this is called a Schauder basis, and, um, and the closure of its linear span is called, a Schauder, is called a Schauder sequence. Now, I emphasize here that order counts. So you can have a Schauder base, 
and change the order and no longer shadow base. It's one of the really nasty things that all of the intuition we gain by finite dimensional objects turns out to be bad. Everything you think that should be true is not. That's, that's one of the things that the sad facts about Banach spaces. Um, so I'll come, I'll come to that point in a second. So I'll just give you some examples. These are fairly hard to construct. So Ha had actually constructed a shouter base, this is 17 years earlier, for the LP spaces, and they're described as follows. So they're these, um, these step function, piecewise definable functions. It's known as a Haas system and forms the basis for LP01 for every one less than or equal to P less than or equal infinity. And if you have a shouter base, your space must be separable. So all infinity doesn't have a shouter base. So these are the natural things. You say, okay, how hard can they be to construct? So the very first question was asked by Banach, and we actually know the answer to this one. Suppose I give you a separable space. Must it have a shadow basis? And this, this um, in the area of Barnack space theory, this um, actually described the architecture of the area for a long time. Um, 40 years, people tried to solve this question. And the answer is no. Um, by someone called Per Enflo, E-N-F-L-O. And not a particularly easy paper to read either. But fortunately, a student of Vasco Brasca called um, Bossehoff proved, uh, did an analysis of this paper and there's a computable copy of Enflow's example. So hence there's a computable Banach space without something for, called the approximation property, which I'll come to soon, and hence doesn't have a Banach space. Part of this area is that every time someone proves that a Banach space doesn't have a shouter basis, they don't do it that way. They prove that the, the Barnack space doesn't have a property implied by having a, 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 a basis, right? So they pick some property. This particular property was something called the approximation property. If you have a shouter base, then you have the approximation property. This thing didn't have the approximation property, hence it didn't have a shouter base. So the first question, well, this is, what's the complexity of having a basis? Very simple question. What's the complexity of the, okay, so we're computability theorists say, what's the complexity of the index set of computable Barnack spaces that have a computable basis? How hard can it be, right? Um, so first off, there's no a priori upper bound that's easy to calculate. Sigma one, two is the upper bound. Sigma one, two. But no, 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 we, we get it down to sigma one, one we, we, with, with heroic effort, right? So, so um, let X be a Barnack space and suppose I give you a sequence of non-zero elements, then X is, this is like a fundamental fact. The next I is the shouter basis of X if and only if there's a constant K called the basis constant such that these, such that th this, this K kind of generates the tail sum, the, it bounds the tail sum. So if you look at the projections of the first M things, then it's always less than or equal to the um, to the following ones, and the finite linear span is dense. So, so this is this shouter basis. That's a shout. This basis constant, something that that characterizes. If you have one of these things, you've got a shouter basis. If you have, um, if you have a shouter basis, you must have one of these basis constant. Okay, so. Um, and the proof of the harder direction of the lemma consists of considering the projections associated with the bases. So if you look at SK of the first, um, if you, you, you look at the projection of the, the whole sum onto the first K elements, right? And the, then one is equivalent to the, the value of the soup being finite. Now this thing converges, it better be the case of that soup's finite. So that's, that's why it's true. Um, and once you stare at that, yep. 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 So the question was, if that condition is true, is it a, is it a shadow basis? And the answer is yes. It's a, an equivalent condition. It's an if and only if condition. Okay. So um, so the basis constant is the, the that soup value. So you've got these finite projections, 
the shout of the, the basis constant will simply be the, the soup of those. Um, and then the basis constant of the space is the infimum of all the basis constants of the bases. Nothing is known about that. There's very little known about the what possible basis constants you can have for spaces, except for the finite dimensional case. So the basis constant is called the infimum of all the basis constants of all the bases, and you let it be infinity if it has no, has no basis constant. A basis is called monotone, so intuition fails too. You would think that if I have one with a basis constant 5, I surely have one with a basis constant 1 just by mucking around with things. The answer is no. If there is, so first of all, if a basis has a basis constant one, it's called monotone. Hilbert spaces, so where you have a bit of, where you have a notion of um, orthogonality, they always have a monotone basis. But in 1983, Zarek proved that there are finite dimensional, finite dimensional spaces. And they're Banach spaces, and they do not have a basis with basis constant one. This is very counterintuitive. Not infinite, finite dimensional, like dimension 10 or something. It was bizarre. And um, Rufai, who is a student of Noam, Rufai Z, showed that for every K, for sufficiently large N, there's a computable norm on Rn whose associated uh, basis constant is greater than K. So Zarek's theorem can be made um, computable. This was not an easy job because Zarek's, Zarek's paper is impenetrable. You, you have to read Zarek's paper. To read Zarek's paper, you have to read the paper before. To read the paper before, you have to read the paper before that. Every one of them is building on things. And it's written purely for analysts who understand everything. And for, for normal human beings, it was really very difficult. Um, and um, now what's another thing about how we build a vector space. How, how do you build a basis for a vector space? Hmm. You start with one element. And what do you do? Find one independent over that, add it. And find one independent over that. And you continue until you're finished. Right? It's really hard to do that for Barnack spaces. You just, it's really, you, building a basis sequentially is, is very difficult. And this, this is why the upper bound's so high. Right? So, um, so there are examples of Banach subspaces of a space, V, a subspace of W, with the dimension of W is finite. W has a basis with um, constant D. V has a basis with basis constant D, but the basis constant, the basis of V with constant D cannot be extended to one of W with constant D. This is very, very counterintuitive. So I have one of basis constant four for the smaller space. I know there is one for basis constant four for the bigger space. But I can't take the one that I've got so far and extend it to one with basis constant four for the bigger space, even though there is one. It's very strange. Um, so Bosserhoff was the first person to... Um, it's a pity he didn't stay in the in the area. I think he, I think he went out and became a computer scientist. But so let X be a computable Banach space. And he said he was the first person to really look at what the basis constants are. And he said, suppose I give you a finite dimensional Banach space, uh, then the basis constants computable uniformly in the in the X zero to X n. So at least in the finite dimensional case, we can compute the thing. That's good. And again, um, I'll just point at one little bit. It's basically you kind of do the ob ob obvious thing, but the, the obvious thing involves the fact that these things are, um, if the Banach space is computable, then the projection onto the unit ball is computably compact. So therefore, using computable compactness, you can actually compute the real, which is the basis constant. This is essential use of computable compactness. It's not the way Banach, Bossehoff wrote it up. Um, if you do want to read Bossehoff's thesis, don't read the paper, read the thesis. You can download it. The paper is like, like four pages. The thesis is 200 pages and, and somehow he rendered that down to four pages, I don't know. Uh, we improved this actually, the basis constant of the space is also computable. 
So that's if you remember the ephema of all the basis constants for the for the for the for the space. The proof is slightly more elaborate use of computable compactness. Um, for the infinite dimensional space, what can we say? Well, if I, um, but the basis constant is less CE because it, 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 it only gets bigger or smaller, whatever it is. So we can approximate it. Good. And you can, can, you can, um, you can reverse that. If I give you any left CE real, there's a Barnack space whose basis, uh, uh, there's a basis such that the basis constant is exactly that. The proof's not very hard. Um, it also shows the degrees of basis for those you don't know what this means, the Turing degrees are closed upwards. Um, but let X be a computable Barnack space with a basis. What's the complexity of the basis constant for the space? I don't know. It looks hard. It looks hard. All of this looks hard. <laughs> <laughs> so Bossehoff then analyzed N-flows construction and showed, roughly speaking, so remember N-flows construction is one which constructs a Barnack space without a basis. And Bossehoff observed that you can kind of follow that construction for long enough to be able to diagonalize from computable bases, then go back. And using that strategy, show there's a computable Barnack space with a shouter basis, but no computable shouter base. Right? So it's a, it's a very natural strategy to use. The construction um, is not hard at all. And um, so next question. Suppose that X is, has, has a, a computable Barnack space with no computable shouter basis. Um, What's the complexity of some basis of it? I mean, is it does it have an arithmetical basis? Does it have a hyper arithmetical basis? You don't. Know? I don't know. <laughs> you, you get the you should, you should get the impression that we're just scratching the ground floor here, and it's true. I mean, I, we're on the floor. We're scratching along because we're just proving little theorems. So we don't. You know, the big questions seem very hard. Suppose. Um, so Busserhoff had the following very interesting question. Suppose X is a computable um, Barnack space, sorry. Suppose that a computable Barnack space has a, has a monotone shouter basis. That means has basis constant one. Must X have a computable basis? Because his example did not have this property, right? So it's kind of nice. Um, Bossehoff's construction gives a computable presentation of a Barnack space with a basis but no computable one. The following things, following what seems open. Is there a computable Barnack space with a basis? Oh, so the question here is, is this presentation dependent? So Bossehoff's example was, here's an example of a particular Barnack presentation, a given presentation of a Barnack space. With a uh, with a basis, but no computable basis. But it, can you make one with that's intrinsic? So all of the copies have this property. We don't know. The, the, we the current techniques. I mean, this may not be that hard. If I had to toss a coin, I'd say it's random. No, um, <laughs> it may not be so hard that hard. But it, it could be. It could be. It could be accessible. This question. So what were we able to prove? We are able to prove that um, the index set of computable Barnack spaces with computable shouter bases is what you'd expect, sigma 3 complete. Roughly speaking, of course, being computable is kind of sigma 3. Um, this is proved with a variation of Bossehoff's construction. So we haven't really gone very far. We've just been fiddling around with Bossehoff throwing in an index set construction in there. So roughly speaking, what you do is sigma three means there is an X such that a certain infinitary condition holds. There is an X such that for all S there is a T, blah, 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 blah. And what happens is whenever you, you guess an X and whenever it looks like it's true, you say, I'm gonna copy Bossehoff's construction, right? And whenever it's not, you, you do something else. And then if you if the if the thing fires for some k infinitely many times, you will have copied it. And if it doesn't, then you'll do something else. Okay. Um, so um, 
here are some other questions you might say about uh, Banach spaces and their bases. Every infinite dimensional Banach space, separable or otherwise, has an infinite dimensional subspace with a shadow base. This is due to someone called Mazur, who was a famous mathematician. Now, it's interesting for vector spaces, there's an infinite dimensional vector space over the rationals with no infinite computable independent sets. Every, every computable, every C um, element is um, finite. Independent elements finite, it says finite. But on the other hand, for, for Barnack spaces, that's not true. If X is an infinite dimensional computable Barnack space in our sense, then it's a computable basic sequence in X. Mm. So somehow or other, the, the norm gives you some access to things you wouldn't anticipate you'd have that access to. This is not a particularly difficult proof. And if you look at the paper in the proceedings, it give, we've given the full proof there. And here's a question if you for those generally computable Banach spaces, we don't know. More generally, I, I would say the answer is no. It's surely not going to be that hard. There's one of these generally computable Banach spaces where the norms left CE, like, like L infinity or something, where, um, where there is no infinite dimensional um, subspace with a with a, with the shadow basis. So for the general question, the complexity of shouting a basis, we can we were able to prove it was pi three hard. So it's arithmetic, we have an arithmetic lower bound. The upper bound is sigma one one. That, that's a big gap. That's not good. No. So one of the reasons for the enormous gap is that all constructions of separable Barnack spaces without a basis do so by constructing a separable Barnack space failing to have a property implied by having a basis. So there are all these properties. So what happened was mathematicians couldn't solve the Barnack space in a uh, Barnack's question. So we did what we normally do. We say, well, here's a question we can solve, right? And then published a paper on it and got promoted and all that kind of things. So they invented all these concepts which give insight into the geometry of the situation. And these, um, these properties seem to come naturally from attempts to solve Barnack's question and have since become important in their own, air, in their own right. And I'm just going to quickly sketch a couple of these properties um, just to, to so you can see what they are. There's a thing called a shadow decomposition. Um, a shadow decomposition is an infinite sequence of closed subspaces. Right? And for every... so. A basis says, you give me an element, I'll give you an infinite linear combination that sums to that element. This says, well, okay, I have these spaces. I'll use the board. They're closed because they're round, right? And it says, if you give me an element, then I can choose something from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, and they and I can add them up and get the element. Something like that. Where ZI is in ZI is in the, in the I space. Um and the a shadow basis is simply a one-dimensional version of this. Right? Now it's possible to have a shouter base, uh, have this property and not have a shouter base, which is again shows how, how bad our intuition is. So you have these collection of finite, actually finite dimensional, finite dimensional spaces, such that every element in the space is an infinite linear combination of, of, of things from chosen from the spaces. And yet it doesn't have a basis. Uh, don't ask me why that's true. It's just it's just true. Zarek proved this um, is strictly weaker than having a shadow basis. There's something called local basis structure. If I give you a Barnack space, I said to have local basis structure, LBS. If there's a constant K, such that if you give me a finite dimensional subspace with basis constant K, I can extend it. Well, sorry. There is a finite dimensional extension not the basis, but the finite dimensional extension with the same basis constant, right? Again, this is a, an example of something which 
would normally work in vector space land, but fails to work in Barnard space land because you think you could just, as I said before, you think you could just take your partial basis and extend it to a bigger one and says this, but you can't. Enflow's original construction constructed a separable Barnack space with local basis structure, but no computable, uh, no, no basis. Ruafoy gave the only known complete index set with, um, answer. The index set of computable Barnack spaces with local basis structure is sigma three complete. Not just sigma three hard, it's sigma three complete. So it's the only example I know of uh, where we actually know what the index set is. Um, uh, uh, do we really want to do this? There's a thing called like approximation property. And it kind of says that you can approximate the space with a series of approximations. That's, that's what all the stuff in green says. Actually, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm blue, green, colorblind, so it could be blue, but I think it's green. It's like, but anyway. Um, so Zarek constructed something with the basis approximation um, uh, property, but without local basis structure. So it, it's, these are these are interesting um, theory. I'm not going to get through the the details of this. This just talks about the operators. The thing about the theory of Barnack spaces, the thing that makes it hard for us as as computability theorists, is that almost every proof they do uses duality. Duality is the key thing. Duality is not effective. That's bad. So every time you prove a theorem, you have to find some other way of doing it. Right, either saying, "Oh, this duality is kind of like Pontryagin duality, or something like that," and I can make it effective, or you go, "There's there's some other method of getting around it." So, the theorem we were able to prove these <laughs> these, these are sad statements of 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 lack of lack of ability. Right, this is this is the feeble things we were able to prove that having a basis is um. Having a basis is pi three hard and lives inside of sigma one one. Sigma one one is there is a function such that blah 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 is true. This is about as big a gap as you can possibly have. Um, basis approximation property, not too bad. The index sits somewhere between pi three and sigma four. That's probably accessible. Having the approximation property is pi one one. <laughs> that, that's not good either. Pi three and pi one one. Uh, a finite dimensional decomposition is between pi three and sigma one one, and a shouted decomposition is between pi three and sigma sigma one one. So the question is, figure out what the answer is, because because we don't know. But we, we I intend to go back to this. But it's it's part of the game of being Barnack spaces. We seems to be that it's full of people that goal seems to be constructing yet another even more ugly Barnack space. Like there's a paper by Tim Gowers and somebody where he constructs like the, the most ugly Barnack space known to mankind, right? And, you know, another one will come out soon. And so the, the, ultimate, the ultimate point there is that we lack techniques. We don't know what to do, you know. Oh, sorry. So, so there, are, there's, there are many other bases, kinds of bases for Barnack space. Shadow base is just one example. And shadow bases themselves are subdivided into a million different kinds of bases. There are things called shrinking bases, monotone bases, absolute bases. Absolute bases means you can, any permutation is still a basis, right? And aside from about two to three papers by Vasco Bracker and his students, very little is known about any of these. But for example, if you have a, a shrinking absolute base, then your, your dual space turns out to be computable. That, that, that's something that Vasco proved. Um, having a shrinker basis um, allows for the duality. There is a basis notion that every separable Barnack space has. It's called a Markusevich basis. And it was from 1943. There's a definition there, which I'm not even going to try and uh, allude to. But there is this notion that every Barnack space has one of these um, Markusevich bases. Nobody has ever examined it at all. Right. So the question is, say something about them. Anything. I mean, how can you ever compute any of them ever? Right. As you can see, Barnack spaces provide a plethora of fascinating and demanding questions. And I think 
if we're looking for an area to explore which really is pertinent to modern analysis and additionally has lots of very challenging questions i i think that these are definitely worth studying i i, I was because what happened was the um long said oh i wouldn't mind doing a master's degree and i said okay and i said oh Barnack spaces they can't be so hard let's go and look at them and and at the end of about uh, six months, we said, these are really hard. <laughs> but uh, Long did a, a tremendously strong uh, job. And it's just a matter of, I think, putting, investing the time into understanding the literature, which is very rich and very interesting. It's a bit like, like group theory, where um, people are coming out with all these different kinds of groups and you know you classify them. Same about Barnack spaces, it just seemed to be a bit more difficult. So um, I, do, I do hope you, you feel challenged I do hope you've seen something that you've probably never seen before. And um, thank you. Thank you very much. So, we have time for a few questions. No problem. I can shout. Oh, of course you can, Bass. So the isomorphism for all computable spaces is well for, for 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 general barrack spaces, right. yeah, right. But uh, you could not like the equal reduction with graphs of feet or what did you reduce? We we did it using a factor of Pontryagin duality and used um, um uh, Boolean algebras. Yeah, so um oh sorry. Um yeah, we no we used um we used Boolean algebras and, and via um, effective Pontryagin duality. So if you know what that is. Uh, Pontryagin duality is, is something which we haven't really explored much and Melnikov convinced me it was something that was definitely worth doing. And that's that you, and it's a classical thing, it's a classical technique. You study uncountable objects using countable objects. So um, you, you um, yeah, it, 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 it's so, um, so for, for every uncountable object, there's a there's a way of convert there's, there's a there's a, it's, it's 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 usually some limiting process that gives you the uncountable object from finite objects. So if you understand the finite objects or the countable objects, then you're then you can understand the uncountable things. So like uh, profinite groups is an example of things coming from that where you where you're studying like the Galois groups and the the absolute Galois groups, the profinite groups, and the the anyway. The, 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 so that's the whole thesis of the new book that we're writing is the fact that dualities have not yet been explored enough and should be because we feel we understand countable structures pretty well uh, as, as computability theorists you know we don't understand the uncountable very well yeah. anyway thank you so thanks a lot so can i hello yeah <laughs> yeah hey Ron, it's goha here Oh, hell, yeah. Oh, 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 thanks a lot. So it yeah. seems that we need to add a functional analysis as a part of a course for logic. Okay. Right. One of the things actually uh, I saw you have was this kind of the citation about the Cardit theorem. So the yes. other one is actually when you have the separable table space, all right, it, they are all isometrically isomorphic to L, L2 space. Correct. Any analogy of what you said for this kind of the R group of N to that one, um, to the Hilbert space version? In in my opinion, is I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> it's, good, it's a good question, but I, I I'm not going to pretend that I know the answer to it. So okay, it's a good there in Beijing. <laughs> oh, I'm not in the yeah yeah not in Beijing in the yeah yeah my hometown yeah with my parents yeah yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you say a little more about why this uh, order matters in those shouter bases? Uh, or not, if you don't want to. No, I, I, I don't. I mean, we, we can sit and talk, but it's, 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 big. It, it just does. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's bizarre. It's, it's, these are absolutely, they're, they're sequences, and it's important that they're sequences. And they're very special ones where you, the order doesn't matter. These absolute bases, yeah, yeah. You got to look. You got to pick up one of these books. There's millions of them on 
Well, I've seen a lot of many on, on Barnack's prices. Yeah. Yep. What, what, why is the basis constant important? I mean, other than... Because it's the only way we know to analyze um, the bases. We, we, we don't have techniques to, to analyze the bases directly. So the question was, why, do basis, why is the basis constant important? And every thing I know that's ever been proved about base shadow bases uses basis constants. I think because you get the theory of linear operators in there too, because it's all about projections and things. Yep. Thank you. So you have a number of theorems of the form for every computable X, like bottom space, there is a computable Y. Yes. And some of them are uniform. Yes. And if they're uniform, I would assume that they relativize. Yes. The and therefore they're continuous. Yes. Is there any error of finding some sort of natural continuous function that's not actually computable, where you need an oracle? It's it's good to have hopes. Yes. Um, yeah, it's 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 quite possible. Um, you know, the the I, I think there is Banach spaces have been studied quite a lot of descriptive set theory land. It's quite possible that if you troll through the the the, the literature there, you'd see things which weren't computable but needed a, a jump or two arithmetical. I don't think you're going to need more than that. Okay, but but if you need a jump, then it's not continuous. Well, it's continuous relative to an oracle, zero jump, right? I mean. Uh, well, okay, if you're only looking at computable ones. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, if you're looking at everything, you say, well, it's continuous in your job. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I mean, but it's a, it's a way we should teach continuity. We should say, it's, well, it's just, just computable relative to an oracle first you should. Yeah, but, but at the same time, you can have something that's continuous without being computable, which would suggest there's actually a reason. To oh, yeah, yeah. No, a good, a good example is like the Hanbanak theorem. Where where you can it's provable that you need you need either let's just say in a computable case you need the jump but um in, in the in the in the type two sense you'd need the the limb function or something yeah so so the harmonic theorem is true there are very few theorems you stare at which are actually computably not true in the the small spaces but the harmonic theorem is a classic example where it's not it's not so. Yeah. Peter. Thank you. Um, one of these mystery theorems you mentioned was the construction where you had to uh, find a place from finite dimensional spaces, but not from single dimensional spaces. So, what is the obstruction of creating the one dimensional basis to reach the finite ones and combine them? Yeah, be, 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 uh, if they were one dimensional, you could, but they're finite dimension. And it's 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 one of these things that the it's the norms that the, the it's the compatibility of the norms with the chosen basis. It's it's um it's it's very hard to describe exactly what goes wrong until you start studying these things. It's 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 um I I I I I mean when if I do like a priority argument or something, I feel I have tremendous intuition as to what's going on because I've been doing it since like I was you know forty five years or something right. This stuff I've only been doing a while, and I'm still at the case where I, I can kind of understand what they're doing, and I can prove theorems about it, but I don't really have that gut intuition as to why things are true. And and the the inability of the people doing the classical work to prove theorems demonstrates that nobody does. I mean, it's really something where it's very much in a state of active development. Every every five years, a new theorem comes out. Here's another Arnach space that has this property, but not that property. So it's very ad hoc. You look at the, the, the proofs are kind of ad hoc. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Oh, it does the job. No, so much longer. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask something in the same line. I know that people in classical analysis they have these papers in which another algorithmic construction of a basis, but. Yeah. Where is the goal? I don't, I don't have. I mean, I haven't read the papers. I haven't. Well, I mean, the, the, you, you can't necessarily. Is there an agenda? I think the agenda is to to un, to to classify all these properties as to, you know, firstly, they didn't know these properties were even different for a long, long time. 
So many of the papers would finish, oh, is the basis approximation property different than, is the, is the finite dimensional shadow decomposition property different than the shadow decomposition property and things like that. And people had no idea how to do this. These are just classical questions that, you know, and I mean, they're obviously, they must be somewhat important because they appear in like Inventiones Mathematics and Annals of Mathematics and things like that. So, you know, they're, they're genuinely difficult and, and interesting questions of at least the people working in this area. I found it fascinating, to be honest. I, I thought, oh, wow, well, these are really interesting. But I just don't have the, I, I just, if you do mathematics long enough in some area, you develop an intuition as to what's likely to be true. Uh, not yet. <laughs> Give me another 10 years, maybe. You know, but... Well, you need young people to do it. Yeah.